So what's underneath my food here? Well, a box full of vacuum tubes. And another box full of vacuum tubes. Pick these ones off of Craigslist. And uh, I have no idea what they are, but there's definitely some interesting ones. So uh, let me finish off my food there, and maybe we can start taking a look at them. I have no idea what this is, but it's from RCA. All right, well, let's start with this one. Here's the indications on it. Made in USA. It says here, licensed only to extent indicated on carton. Well, good thing I don't have the carton. It has some sort of lens on the top. It uh, has some sort of goop on, on the lens here. I'm not sure what that would be. Feels like some sort of adhesive. Probably shouldn't touch it too much since it's unknown. And it has absolutely beautiful construction on the inside. Any guesses as to what this might be? I'm going to look it up now. I honestly have no clue. It could be some sort of detector or a light emitter. I'm not I'm not sure. I do know this came off of some sort of test or medical equipment. I don't know any more than that. Looks like it maybe has a couple built-in fuses down there. Those two glass things down there. Perhaps that's another fuse over there. Last chance for a guess. Let's see what it is. Well, as it turns out, this is a photomultiplier. Basically, it is used in uh, equipment that needs to measure low incident light. So, uh, say radiation detectors or other types of scientific uh, instruments. Um, it has a maximum uh, reaction wavelength of about uh, 4,400 angstroms. So that would be around blue. Let's see, blue has its maximum response up there. So here's the schematic of the device, and uh, for those of you who are not familiar with how a uh, photomultiplier tube works, uh, I will explain it real quick. They're actually quite simple, at least in theory, of course. So that um, brownish colored lens you saw at the top was actually a photocathode, and what that does is when light hits the photocathode, it emits you know, a couple of uh, electrons, known as photoelectrons. Um, in this device, those photoelectrons go through, you know, some focusing grills and et cetera, et cetera, and they hit this surface here. Now, this surface is what's known as a dynode or dynode. I'll just say dynode. And uh, basically, what happens when an electron hits this dynode, it releases a couple more electrons. So let's say you get one electron coming in here, it hits this, and then it releases, say, two electrons. Those are then channeled onto this other dynode, which then, say, releases four electrons because there were two electrons hitting it. And then so forth, they bounce around until they finally hit the last dynode, and then they hit the uh, anode. Uh, and then you uh, detect the current forming at the anode in your you know, equipment, and you can use it to quantify the amount of light coming in. Now, as you can sort of guess, these things have very high gain. You know, uh, you could have a single electron coming in here, and you could have, well, lots of electrons. I don't know what the actual gain is per stage here, but uh, you could imagine, you know, uh, it grows exponentially as you go along. And the way uh, electrons are channeled from uh, one dynode to the next is basically um, this is held at some voltage, and this one is held at a voltage that's more positive say, uh, typically 100 volts more positive than this one, so that the electrons are attracted uh, to this. And here's the connection diagram. See, each dynode is brought out to a pin, and you've got your anode, and all that kind of stuff. 
here's the uh, sensitivity graph amps per lumen and various other characteristics cool let's see what's next so next I've got these three 201A 393's arranged in order of serial number looks like this one was made in 1994 and it has a much more recent serial number than this thing up here they almost look like laser tubes but I'm, I'm not sure you've got uh, some sort of optical device at the end there a couple terminals they almost look like uh, discharge tubes some sort of lamp perhaps but I don't know what the center part would be for looks like there's some uh, mounting hardware on the end and uh, one electrode down there these have definitely seen some wear you can see the uh, different colored material on the inside of that inner tube there same with this one this one looks uh, pretty much pristine let's see what these are alright well after some searching lots of not founds lots of wayback machine failures seems like these are helium neon laser tubes go figure Wikipedia ha I was looking at the Wikipedia article and here you go pretty much exactly what you see here so yeah you got your anodone, your cathode, the gas reservoir, and you know the two mirrors, the half silvered and the full silvered mirrors. And there you go. Let's proceed. All right, this next one also looks to be a photomultiplier. Saticon H8397 from Hitachi, made in Japan. Well, unfortunately, uh, I couldn't find any data sheets for this thing, um, and I actually wasn't able to find a single reference to this uh, this part number here, the H eight three nine seven or this nine F two twenty. However, looking at uh, this Saticon um, trademark here, it seems to be a series of video cameras. So I did a little bit of digging, and if you look. This is, uh, these are, you know, not the same tubes, but they look very similar. Uh, and these turn out to be, uh, camera tubes. So, if we consult the mighty Wikipedia, we learn that one of these is exactly the same as one of these, you know, CRTs, except in reverse. So, in one of these things, you have an electron gun in the back, it emits a stream of electrons, these coils deflect the electron beam causing it to strike an area of phosphor that converts the uh, incoming electron beam into well some visible light that you can see and then these coils scan the beam across each row causing it to build up an image and then when it gets to the bottom it starts up at the top and then it scans well, this is pretty much exactly the same, except, like I said, in reverse. So, at the back, instead of an electron gun, you have a photodetector. In the middle, you still have some coils or other means of deflecting, uh, you know, electron beams. And at the front, instead of a phosphor, you have a photocathode. And all that means is the photocathode, when it's hit by an oncoming photon, uh, emits electrons. So basically you've got your, elect uh, your photons coming in, you know, your image of whatever it is you're filming, hits the photocathode, 
and basically what you get out of the photocathode is an image except instead of photons creating the image it's electrons so you got this wall of photons coming in representing your image boom they hit the photocathode and then you've got a wall of photons or sorry of electrons going down that represent your image then the coils scan back and forth moving the image of electrons around so that uh, only a very small part of the incoming image can hit the photodiode, or sorry, the photo detector at the back at any given time. All right, as a little practical example, I'm just holding, you know, a bolt or a little adapter on the camera lens. So pretend that instead of uh, seeing photons, you're seeing electrons because you're the uh, photo detector at the back of that uh, video tube. And all you're seeing is this. Whoop. You're just scanning back and forth, building up an image. Whoop. Sorry if you're getting motion sick, but you kind of get the point. So you can basically think of these as the old-timey equivalent of the CCD charge-coupled device found uh, in, you know, say this camera here. So it's the precursor to that. And uh, they had some fairly serious limitations, uh, not the smallest of which is the fact that if you ever accidentally aimed this at the sun, or even the reflection off of something that you, uh, through which you could see the sun, it would burn out uh, the photodetector down here, or the, um, the uh, photocathode at the front, <laughs> which would ruin your entire day. And then you'd have to pull this out, find a new one, and uh, plug it in really not ideal. And I've actually got two of these. <laughs> I wonder if they're burnt out. I wonder how hard it is to actually drive these things. I might try. <laughs> well, here's the uh, remains of the first box. I'm pretty sure none of these are particularly interesting. I've only got two remaining big ones. Let's take a look. This one is just a uh, basically high power amplifier. Nothing too special radio frequency. Fairly popular for ham radio back in the day. You can also make uh, audio amplifiers and, you know, everything you'd use an amplifier for. Next. So this thing is uh, probably a deuterium lamp. Um, judging by the D over there, there's no other markings that I can make much sense of. Um, but basically these are used in spectroscopy or whenever you need uh, you know, a u ultraviolet light source. So it would make sense this would be in a medical uh, piece of equipment. Um, basically, you feed in you know, a couple hundred volts, something like maybe 300 or a bit higher, uh, and you just basically make an arc across there, and uh, that produces your light. I might try to fire this up later, but honestly, I'm scared of a. <laughs> excess uh, ultraviolet light, so maybe not today. And all the rest of these other ones all look like, you know, fairly bog standard um, you know, tetrodes or pentodes, so I'm not going to really look too much at these. You know, there's several brands, Raytheon, I don't know, RCA, Toshiba, don't know, don't know. Ooh, what's this? I don't recognize that logo. G, all the usual suspects. I'll leave these for a rainy day. It'd probably be good for replacing some of these, but uh, they probably wouldn't sound as good. All right, next box. All right, this box contains a lot more varied stuff. We've got no idea what these are. Ah, vacuum gauge tubes. Anyways more of these lamps, miscellaneous discharge lamps, and random other things. Let's dig in. Uh, so I think I was right with what the other one was. This one actually says deuterium lamp. Cool. This one looks to be some other kind of lamp. Osram, made in Germany. Hmm, couldn't find anything about it. Next. Well, this looks to be some sort of short arc lamp. IS-22-S? 
Sperti, made in, uh, looks like it says Hoboken, USA. Cool. Well, I couldn't find any documentation for this particular lamp, but um, looking for Sperti and Hoboken, found this guy. So, <laughs> this is Sperti's timeline of excellence. So basically, uh, his company, um, you know, Mercury Arc, which I don't think it's, this one is as old as 1933, but Sperti makes some sort of uh, tanning or full spectrum lighting. So this is probably, you know, either Mercury or some, some other type of uh, arc lamp. No idea on the specs. Looks pretty well used. And actually, if we look here, 1954, uh, moved from Cincinnati to Hoboken. So that dates it to at least 1954. So this assembly, again, I don't know what it is. There's these tubes in here. See, inside of uh, some foam to keep them in place. They look like lamps to me. Take one of them out. You can see kind of how it's constructed. But yes, they kind of look like lamps of some kind, some phosphor in here. Maybe they're indicators, I'm not sure. We'll have to power one of up, one of them up somehow. See what happens. Just put random high voltage across it and see what happens. There's only two wires, so <laughs> who knows? I suppose the yellow one is a uh, high voltage, and the blue one is a uh, is a ground. I'm not sure. I need to invest in some uh, decent UV blockers because <laughs> I have no idea what kind of light this will produce. But it doesn't look like an arc, so uh, we'll see. Now we're talking. This is a uh, Mercury short arc lamp made by Osram. It's a HBO series, uh, 200 watts, and uh, looks like they still make them. That's all about all there is to say to this thing. It's definitely used. You can see some clouding on the inside, but. Uh, Definitely uh, no ultraviolet protection on this thing. Could be useful for exposing PCBs. So uh, you've got your power going through here, something you know, 60 to 70 volts for your arc, and then you've got this uh, excitation electrode where you supply a pulse to uh, start the main arc across those two electrodes going across the middle there. More UV light. Protect eyes. Yep. And this is just a uh, gas butter tube. I don't know if uh, that discoloration is the original or if this thing is leaked, but uh, I should try it out. Very simple to drive these things. Basically, these work by uh, releasing a couple electrons when a photon hits. Um, you know, the plate here, and those electrons are attracted to the other plate and create a current. And then you detect that current in the circuit, and there you go. And let's see, another some sort of a unidentified arc lamp. There's no markings on this at all. Smaller version of the Osram uh, Mercury lamp. This one's 100 watts. Whole bunch of ultraviolet lamps, not sure of the kind. Couldn't bother to look it up. Let's see. <laughs> Caution, UV rays. Well, gee, thanks. You said it was a UV lamp. And it looks like uh, a similar um, photo tube, except this one doesn't have discoloration, so maybe the other one is burnt out or otherwise screwed up. But it is a different model number, this thing. This giant thing is a hydrogen thyrotron, um, which is basically kind of like a transistor, but uh, not quite. Um, these are gas-filled as opposed to vacuum, um, and uh, apparently hydrogen thyrotrons were used for either fast switching or um, high voltage. This thing can handle something like 2,000 volts, something like that. Let's see. 
peak anode voltage is oh 3000 volts so there you go these two are uh, RF amps 6146 by Mullard foreign made these two appear to be uh, tetrodes apparently they are uh, British made um, the lettering has rubbed off on this one but it looks exactly the same as this thing these are 3D 21A's well this one says made in USA so I don't know maybe they're different but they definitely look to be the same on the inside these two tubes are uh, pentodes this is a uh, 6L6-GC tube from Hitachi. These things are popular for uh, guitar amps and various things like that, although they can be used for radio applications as well. It's a tetrode. This uh, apparently was made in England, but I can't tell what the manufacturer is. It's been rubbed off but that's an 8105 which apparently is a high frequency tetrode no idea what this is apparently it's old searched for uh, that number on the internet and all I got was a bunch of uh, porn <laughs> actually uh, but it might be a double tetrode ah this one's cool so uh, it's Victorine Corotron made in Cleveland Ohio now, uh, apparently this is a voltage regulator, but uh, there's no 5 volts here. <laughs> Jeez. That's some serious voltage. Awesome. Couple more photo detectors. This is a UV photo tube. See? These serious looking things are all clistrons. This one's made in Italy. I'm of Italian origin, so I especially like this one. Uh, clistrons are used for uh, various high frequency things, super heterodyne uh, receivers, you know, radar. Um, let's see what else. Uh, I'm trying to remember the Wikipedia page where they say, oh yeah, they're also used for like particle accelerators and various cool things like that. Awesome. These three things are obviously vacuum gauge tubes. Basically, there's a little heater in there, and uh, as the pressure increases, uh, the temperature of the uh, filament decreases and it can actually pass less current um, which is kind of the opposite of what you would usually find but anyways you check the current across the filament and that tells you what the pressure is this thing is a uh, one kilohertz crystal and holder so uh, kind of tempted to uh, take this thing apart it's just held together by those little tabs there that just wrap on. I don't want to wreck it, but who else is going to use this? So it's nice and heavy, too. Apparently, these things were used in the Navy um, for uh, radio system calibration equipment. I'll read to you what this thing says it says type CRR. Uh, 40023B crystal and holder for model LM series of uh, oh, it's hard to see LM series of is that of or CFI LM series CFI I guess that'd be calibrated frequency indicating equipment yeah that's what it says there cut AT crystal or cut at I'm not sure why at is in quotes but anyways cut at crystal frequency 1000 KC 
uh, indicating uh, kilocycles plus or minus 10. Let's see, temperature coefficient 0.0001% per degree C at uh, 20 degrees C. Manufactured for Navy Department Bureau of Ships by Bendix Radio Division of Bendix Aviation Corporation, Baltimore, Maryland. Contract number 69767, dated December 27th, 1939. And also contract 87546, dated June 21st, 1941. So it's pretty old. Serial number 311. Six. Cool stuff. Say anything on the bottom? No, the usual licensed only to extent indicated on carton. Okay, thanks. Stupid lawyers. I mean, eh, not stupid. Annoying, though. So this thing is interesting. This is, as you saw there, CTL-954, I believe this is a Tetrode, let me find the <laughs> failing here, this is an army tube, uh, let's see, yep, Tungsol, 1943, so this thing is interesting because it is in the acorn form factor, which was only um, used during the 30s and 40s. Um, before it was superseded and uh, you open this thing and the first thing you see is the license notice in there yeah okay let's try the other side avoid the license notice oh a whole bunch of patents how annoying so you have to pull out this little thing full of patents before you can pull out your tube in any case you can kind of see why it was called the acorn similar size you got your, you know, all your leads like that. And uh, the reason they like to make these small, like this, uh, apart from size considerations, of course, is because uh, as you shrink these down, you get better high frequency response. So, you know, you could operate these at, you know, a couple megahertz or something like that. There's a pretty good article here, which I'll link in the description, talking about these sort of tubes. But yeah, smaller meaning lower inductance, meaning better high frequency response. So this is a miniature ionization tube. I love ions. I love ionized gas. So this thing should be pretty sweet. Let's tear it. Ooh, look at that. So. S <laughs> That's uh, definitely steampunky. It almost looks like a ray gun. Look at that. Let's find out about it. Stay. No. Bad. So this thing actually comes with some documentation. Let's see what it says. Caution. Carefully remove plastic shipping sleeve from within gauge tube before installing. Okay. Let's see. So actually. I should point out that if we remove this thing, it's open on the end. So <laughs> I was hoping for this thing to be gas filled or something, but guess not. Let's see. The GIC 028 is a Bayard Alpert type miniature ionization tube with pressure range of 10 to the minus 3 to 2 times 10 to the minus 10 tor. It is of a direct Degas type permitting pressure indication during Dega. It has two independent oxide coated filaments and can be operated by most control circuits. The GSC 028 has small volume and high conductance to ensure fast pump downs. That doesn't tell me that much because I am obviously a noob when it comes to this kind of stuff. Let's 
the main feature is yttrium oxide coated iridium filament resists burnout when accidentally exposed to high pressure. Cool. Yttrium oxide coating, coated tungsten for long life, both filament spring mount to prevent warping. Non sag tungsten out of the grade, blah blah blah. Hmm. I think we need to turn to the internet. So, quick search. It's a pressure measurement device. So basically, you've got one of those uh, electrodes is a heater, and that creates uh, free electrons, basically, just like in most vacuum tubes. And those race towards another electrode. Well, sometimes when those electrons hit uh, a gas or an atom in a gas, that gas becomes ionized and uh, positively charged as opposed to the electrons which are negative. Then those positively charged ions go towards a third electrode, maybe that really thin one in the middle, but don't take my word for it. And uh, when those ions hit that electrode, you detect a small current. And electrons won't hit that uh, central electrode or whatever the detection electrode is, because that electrode will be uh, negatively charged to begin with. So it will be biased, so that electrons will go away from it. But um, positively charged gas ions will be attracted to it. So it's a very low pressure pressure gauge. Well, now that I've got a bunch of Heaney laser tubes, I got to thinking, why don't I actually, you know, make some of these work? And uh, <laughs> apparently, the way to test these real quick is just to uh, microwave them. This is a uh, Sam's Laser FAQ, by the way. Very good website. So uh, I'll do that in a separate video to maybe appeal to uh, a different crowd. But uh, check my channel and uh, you'll find a video of me microwaving these things. Let's hope they work.